This is Frank Consella and the Crest Views Home Podcast. And in this episode, my guest is Ben Morello. He's been a ski instructor for 30 plus years. So we talk about that and we talk about the Telemark turn since Ben is still uh, one of a few skiers left who prefers the Telemark turn to the Alpine turn, uh, even though he does do both. Uh, in the summer, Ben has a really interesting job, I think, which is building ski lifts. So he is sent all across the western U.S. for the most part. He's been to some other places, and he, he builds lifts. So it sounds like a pretty crazy job to me, uh, walking around steep mountainsides, out in the elements with helicopters flying around and delivering the lift towers that we then get to ski in the winter. So I uh, hope you enjoy the podcast, and let's go ahead and get to it. Today on Crest to Beat is Home, my guest is Ben Morello. So Ben, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got here to Crest to Butte. So I, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. I grew up outside of Philadelphia and grew up skiing in the Poconos, Northeastern PA. Uh, I moved to Crest to Butte, sight unseen, back in, what, uh, 1993. And uh, just came out to ski bum for a winter. Classic story. <laughs> sight unseen? So, so how... Tell, tell me more about how you... I had a connection here. You had a connection here. I okay. Had a, I had a connection here. We'll go into that a little bit more. So that was... Uh, my good buddy, uh, Garrett Miller, who now lives down in Golden. Uh, we grew up teaching skiing together at our home hill in the, Pocon- in the Poconos, Big Boulder. Big Boulder. Uh, <laughs> Big Boulder, yeah. Um, and uh, he had already moved to Colorado a year or two before. And a friend of his, Donnell Gonzalez, who still lives here in Crested Butte... Uh, she had moved, uh, just the previous season. So, um, basically I, uh, kind of wrote his coattails when he was moving back out to, uh, to Colorado. He spent a summer back in, in, in Pennsylvania. And when he came back out to Colorado, I said, Hey man, I'm coming with you. Yeah. Here's my share. Here's my share of the rent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you've been here ever since. So that's, yeah. that's now, uh, 25 plus years. And, Correct. uh, in fact, last winter you got your lifetime pass for working at CBMR for for twenty five years, and that was teaching. So, correct. Um, talk about talk about being a ski instructor here in Crested Butte a little bit. It's fun, you know. I mean, I, <laughs> you spend. You know, I mean, when you're on the clock, you're out skiing. Yeah, uh, you meet people from different. You know, from all from all around. At times, it is work, no doubt. Uh, but uh, you know, after I've, I've now been teaching skiing for. Over 30 years, including my time at my home hill uh-huh. in, in Pennsylvania. Um, that's you know that's how I started teaching when I was old enough to join to join the uh, junior instructor program. There, my parents basically told gave me a choice: earn your pass or buy it yourself. So uh-huh. I had to earn my pass, <laughs> and uh, it turned out to be a good deal. They trained the crap out of us there on that little hill, and uh, when I moved here. I figured it was, you know, a natural thing to do, you know, uh, as a way to save money, number one. Uh-huh. I was moving out here as a, you know, I was 23, but I was still broke as a joke, and, you know. Yeah. Uh, so there was, you know, some, you know, savings of a thousand bucks right there. I didn't have to buy a season pass. Right. You know, but, right. But I knew the deal, you know, from my previous, uh, you know, ski school experience that, you know, being a low person on totem pole, that I wasn't going to get much work. And, you know, of course, I supplemented with other night gigs. There you go. Like like what? What were you doing at night? Uh, cooking, diving. Uh, eventually uh, drove the town shuttle for a few seasons. And, you know. Okay. Typical. Yeah. Typical stuff. How has uh, teaching skiing changed since since 30 years ago? I'll be honest. For me, I don't think it really has. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not. That's not entirely true. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'd say you know, uh, the guest interest is maybe is, is is maybe is maybe changed. What do you mean by the guest interest? Their their interest. What 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 they're interested in doing, especially skiing out. You know, as, uh, skiing here versus uh, where I where I grew up. You know, skiing okay. in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, we 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 taught you know first time skiers, and we just churned them out. 
Uh-huh. You know, you taught a first time ski lesson in an hour and a half, and you just you know it, sent them it, on it, their it, way. It was fact. It, 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 it was take ten or fifteen and go, and you know an hour and a half. You got them up and down the lift, and you showed up. You know a half hour later to the next lineup and. Did create, it again. You know, kind of hope you didn't have to do it again because you know maybe you get to go play and go free ski a little bit. But you no, know. gotcha. Um, uh, I, I'd say you know uh, teaching skiing here, it's definitely more the real deal. Uh, you know, I teach both alpine and tele skiing, so I uh, get a little variety there. Uh, I definitely teach you know all levels. I still teach first time ski lessons uh-huh. even after this many years. Which I don't mind. It's quite entertaining at times. I was going to say, what do you do? You, do you prefer one or the, over the other? Or? Um, well, I definitely prefer to be out moving around on the hill. Yeah, I don't even if it's novice or intermediate terrain. You move around on the hill a little bit. You go get to visit a couple of ski lifts. You're probably going to see a couple of your friends and some other people out there. Uh huh. And you're just out and about. Yeah. You know, if you're stuck down in the gardens and the carpet lands, then it's you know. A little longer day. It's a little longer day. <laughs> Fair enough. Especially if it's like, you know, one of those hot marches. <laughs> <laughs> a hot spring day. One of those hot spring. You know. Sun's out, guns out. Then, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's uh, speaking of telemarking. So you're you're probably more well known as a telemarker since that's what you usually do. Um, and in fact, you won the telemark competition a few years ago. So why why tele? On your free time versus Alpine. I'll be honest, it just feels right for me. Yeah. It just feels right. I can, uh, you skied with me enough to know that I use plenty of my Alpine moves, even with my telly gear, mm-hmm. you know, um, I just feel that I have a little more freedom and... What kind of freedom? What do you mean? Uh, just to move a little bit more. Okay. I'm, I don't feel so static or so, or so locked. Okay. Um, I mean, I still enjoy alpine skiing. Don't get me wrong. I just did a full day of it today uh-huh. in in my uniform. So, you know. yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it, you know, also, uh, boy, the, the 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 impact. I get a lot of uh, just impact, you know, more impact from alpine skiing, especially after a full day of it or a couple of days of it. Really, you think and, so? And it starts to hurt. Really, <laughs> it that's just, interesting. It, it just starts to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like I mean, there's you know, telemark was never you know. The mainstream, but ten or twenty years ago, there were there were a lot of telemarkers. These days, yeah. it's 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 really rare. Do you think it? Do you think it'll ever fade out completely, or do you think it's just going to stay as this very 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 small niche? I think it'll. I, I, I think it'll stick around as a small as a small niche. Yeah, you know, just because I people think, like that term better. I think a lot of people reason. are still are, are still just into it, just to the feel the either the feel of it or uh, maybe other reasons, you know. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it definitely did have, uh, especially around here, it had a, sure had a little, a short little heyday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of where it was reborn from, from everything I understand at least. Yeah. Which was funny because when I first started doing, I never even, you know, I I didn't know about Crested Butte at the time. Uh Um, I only did it because the, uh, the former freestyle team coaches from my home hill, once the uh, the old eighties style freestyle, you know, thing, uh-huh. once that all faded out, they were all just still a uh, really tight group and still skied together, and they all started telling, and they were like the only ones in probably a hundred mile radius, you know, at least you really? know, that, that that did it, and they were quite well known, you know. Why were they telling on a little little tiny mountain in Pennsylvania? Uh, yeah. well, when that tiny little mountain, I mean, when I say tiny mountain, I'm talking, you know. Gold Link with seven lifts and 12 runs. Sure. Actually, sure. chop 200 feet of vert off of Gold Link, and yeah. you know, then you're there. Um, so uh, I think it got, you know, maybe it got a little boring with the Alpine gear. Sure. I mean, we didn't have mogul runs. We only had a mogul field on this run or, well, that, or that run. What's the mogul field? What do you mean by a mogul field versus a mogul run? Well, just this one little zone. That's oh, about one little zone. Half a football field, you know, uh-huh. that was allowed to mogul up, and you know they didn't, yeah. and they didn't groom it out. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So we only had just one mogul field, not a whole mogul run. Gotcha. Not a bump run. Gotcha. So there wasn't. We love skiing bumps, but that's all. It was that, only. That was the only was place only, they were. It was only fifty vertical. Feet, I mean, of not course they the formed uh, every you know anywhere else through the day, but they would mow them down overnight again. Right. Okay. So that's that's your wintertime gig is is a uh, ski instructor, but in the summer you um, 
well, you build lifts. So how did, how did that start? How did you start building ski lifts? Um, I just hopped on uh, as a crew member for the now Red Lady lift. At the time, it was still called the Keystone lift mm-hmm. in 1997 here. And, uh, you know, uh, my father was always in heavy construction, uh, outdoor kind of road construction and utility type work. Okay. So uh, as I, you know... As, as a teenager, he started putting me to work and taught me how to run equipment and gave me that exposure. So as I moved out here, as I said, I had to supplement, you know, ski, you know, ski instructing right. with other night work. Well, summertime, I naturally went to, you know, different forms of construction, uh-huh. you know. Uh, not pounding nails. That's not my gig. I'm not a. You know. So what were you doing? Were you doing landscaping? What were you doing then? Oh uh, no, typically truck driving or equipment operating. Okay. Uh, my first summer was my first. Yeah, I think my first summer I was, uh, you know, a truck driver for. Uh, at the time, it was Houston Lumber, now Alpine Lumber. Okay, right? okay. You're yeah. doing the I was, Yeah, so I was, but I worked in the yard as well. Then I went out and made deliveries. I had a commercial driver's license. I drove a dump truck for Al Mons, for Al's Backo there okay. for a summer. Yep. Um, ran a boom truck for Scotty Moss with Timberworks. Okay, yeah, all right. And, uh, that, was a, that was a summer. So, yeah, I always did some kind of construction, some kind of heavy construction in the summertime. And when the Red Lady left, I happened to know the guy who was assigned to run the project, Bruce Meinzer. He's another. Okay. We have parallel lives. We both build lifts in the summer and both uh, both work in the ski school here. Yeah. So, uh, so I gave him a shout. I said, hey, I can run equipment. I've done concrete work. Give me a job. In this episode's Crested Butte Real Estate Minute, I wanted to answer a question which I am frequently asked, which is what effect Vail has had on Crested Butte Real Estate. Overall, I would say not a whole lot, except for maybe a couple of condo projects on the mountain. But for the most part, I think the jury is still out on what exactly Vail does. I mean, they took over so close to the start of the ski season that I don't know if they've had time to do everything that they're planning to do. Um... And do you think that there will be some new lifts? We've, of course, already heard that they will be replacing the Tia Kali chair. And uh, they've ended their relationship with Arapahoe Basin. So that might have an effect as well, since Arapahoe Basin has steep terrain just like Crested Butte. Also, they have announced a new Keystone Pass, and that's going to have some days at Crested Butte. So it'll be interesting to see what what kind of an effect that has. And all these things are going to have an effect on real estate, I think, down the road as we as we grow into this relationship with Vail ownership. Anyway, my name is Frank Concella. My website is CrestedButteRealEstateAgent.com, and my contact info is there if you have any questions whatsoever about the Crested Butte or Gunnison real estate market. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. So you've been doing that now for, you know, 20 plus years or whatever it is. So um, you never get to know where you're going to go in the summer. They just kind of end up assigning you. So just to give people an idea of where you, where you, what you do. So like, what have the last few summers been like? Where have you been working? Where, where the list been? Uh, most recently, I've um, been at Copper Mountain. We uh-huh. have two big lifts that we uh, that, that we put in there. Yeah. They're basically, they're two main lifts out of the center village, the American Flyer and the American Eagle. Uh-huh. Uh, both of them were six-pack chairs. Uh, the American Flyer is a six-pack chair with uh, bubbles or big hoods. Okay. They're nearly like gondola cabins that you don't take your skis off and it's just a big long bench seat right you know yep uh, but you're pretty enclosed and pretty sheltered in the in there and then the american eagle is a standard six-pack chair but it's actually well we call it a telemix uh-huh. uh, you might call it also a hybrid okay uh, it's four chairs then a gondola cabin four chairs then a gondola cabin so you have your choice to ride in an enclosed cabin or to keep your skis on and just hop on a chair yeah, that was just there, so it's it's kind of interesting because yeah, you, you get on one side and and it's the chair, and the other side and it's the gondola, and yeah. it's kind of funny. You're on the chair, and then like a gondola comes through, and the little gates don't open. And you're like, what's going on? And you're like, oh, there's a gondola. <laughs> so, um, well, where? But again, so what? What are some of the other projects like in the last few years that people might be familiar with? Um, before that, let's see. I did two seasons in a row at uh, at Vale. Okay. Uh, building, let's see, uh, the uh, Lift 11 or the Northwoods Express. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, that was a six pack chair. And then the year before that, I was at Vail again and did lift nine or sun up bowl express. Okay. Sun up is one of the, the it's a small bowls. one. It's a small one, but it's one of the back bowls there. Where was I before that? <laughs> <laughs> I think you did a, I was just at a basin recently. I think you did one of those, right? Didn't you? Uh, I've never done a full project at a oh, basin. I've yours, always, okay. I, I've helped out with a few, with a couple others, but I've never had a full project of my own at, uh, at, at a basin. And then I think you've so, done snow mass. Uh, I've done a few at snow mass. Yeah. Uh, the last Royal one, Gorge. That was a totally different thing, too. The Royal Gorge was a pretty unique project there. A little jig back tram across the canyon. <laughs> that was easy. Only two towers, you know, one on this side, one on that side. With how much in not between? Quite, no, it, I'm joking. It was not for that. No, no I know. Not but, that easy. Well, what, what was the drop in between, though? It was, what, 15? It's, uh, what, I think it's... Tw- Oh geez, they have they named their cafe that you know the, in the new visitor center. It's like twelve thirty or something like okay. that. Twelve hundred um, down to the river. Yeah. Wow, so huge! Yeah. All right, so you, you got it. Yeah, so you mentioned it before. So lift building. So you're starting usually what in like May often. Ideally, yeah, but not always. And May is are are you started? Is that usually tearing apart an old lift in May or commonly. starting from scratch sometimes? No, commonly these days. I mean, you know. There's there are still expansions happening here and there, uh-huh. you know. But uh, I, I'd say, you know, eighty ninety percent of our work is uh, replacing older lifts okay. you know, or upgrading, yeah, okay. in some form or fashion. Uh, yeah, quite often we start in the earlier, you know, in in, in the spring or early summer with a removal project, um, and that's yeah, tearing out an old lift and you know, depending on what's happening with that old lift because some of them still get sold, you know, to you know, some little mom and papa or you know, operation somewhere. Okay. To get rebuilt, and then we have to take a little more care with when we, you know, with, with the with, parts, bring them down. With how we tear tear it down. If it's all getting scrapped, you know, then it's a little more, a little more of a free for all that way. <laughs> let, let it go like you're, like it's timber or something. <laughs> you can timber! drop, you can drop a ski lift tower like a tree. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know. <laughs> so what? Uh, I mean, the towers. So you, you can't reuse them usually, or, or can you sometimes? Uh, at at, at times. Uh, you know, to, to to receive the parts and, uh, and the parts and pieces or components of uh, of a new lift, though, the tower is probably going to have to come down and you know have some modification. Okay, so you can't. Just and put, like, the new... by the by, by the time you get through it all, it's you know it, it, it's the the, the by, it seems to me that the cost difference is you know about you know, fairly negligible okay. to just say hey just get a new one. Okay, let's just do a new one. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah. tip, you know, typically all modern, you know, the, all the more, you know, modern lifts are all galvanized towers. You might be tearing out an old, you know, 30, 40 year old lift that has painted towers, you know, uh, okay. well, if they're painted, well, just like anything else that's painted in the outdoors, it's got to be repainted occasionally, okay. mm-hmm. occasionally galvanizing, you know, is much more it stands up more, a little better yeah. the weather. Yeah. And gotcha. it doesn't, it doesn't have to be maintained period, you know, periodically like, you know, like, like paint. Gotcha, so, gotcha. Uh, yeah, so it's, you know, t- typically you're just getting all new towers. We, uh, you know, uh, say the Vail job over uh, two years ago that I did, um, uh, the Northwoods Express, we reused some of the foundations on the lift line. Okay, that makes from sense. The old, from the old lift. Uh-huh. You know, but there was some testing that had to be done, and some of those foundations that we reused, we had to augment by, you know, drilling and doweling rebar into the existing foundation, and adding concrete to it okay. for the new load because the old lift was a quad, the new lift was a six pack. You're increasing the load, so, right? And uh, you know, so uh, yeah, that's been done at times, but yeah, we think you know me and you know the guys like like me who've been doing it for a while. We prefer it. Sounds like it's more work, but honestly, we would just prefer that we just do all new. Well, yeah, I mean, I've worked in construction. Like you know, remodels are just, not fun and. Brand new is yeah. honestly much much easier, yeah. but yeah. at the same time, yeah. But uh, all right, so just to continue on, so all right, so you've torn everything out, you're starting over, you may or may not be adding. I mean, there's basically a big concrete foundation for each tower. What what else goes into the whole process? Just walk us through it. You know, at least the short version, the Cliff Notes version. 
Well, it all starts with surveying, and then the customer, the ski area operator or owner, you know, they have to approve the profile of the of the lift. Uh-huh. Okay, so that's basically saying, okay, here's this is going to be the bottom station, this is the top, here are all your tower mm-hmm. locations, you know, and that can go back and forth a little bit. They can have a little say in, you know, where a tower lands. Yep. Say, hey, that's right smack in the middle of the ski run. We Can we move it? You know, yep. or, you know, or maybe we'd like it to make this tower a little more accessible for maintenance personnel. Okay. Can, could, yep. could, could we move it? Sure. Or, or hey, if we're going to be flying people 200 feet above the ground here and it's a really windy area. Can we, can we, can we lower <laughs> can this? We, sec- can we maybe know. not freak them out so much. Yeah, you know? yeah. They, they, you know, there, there may be things like that. Um, but uh, so, yeah, profile approval, then... You know, then uh, there are, our engineering department is free to start actually designing, you know, and engineering the the lift. Uh-huh. Um, obviously, we work on forest service land. You know, there are you know a bunch of the uh, rules you know, with them. Yeah, a bunch. Uh, yeah, a bunch. Uh, a bunch of things all associated with that. In certain areas, there are more you know environmental concerns than others. Okay. Um, sometimes we there has to be a uh, a you know. A, uh, say a sensitive uh, vegetation okay. survey done by a botanist by the Forest Service sure. to identify, uh, you know, this plant and that plant. Sure. The moonwort has come up quite often uh, late, lately. What is? Do you do you know much about that plant? I've seen. I've seen, seen. I've seen it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't know why it's uh, what, what 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 it is uh, about 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 it, but yeah. Uh, uh, no, it's just uh, most times they've they've basically amounted to formalities, mm-hmm. you know, that had to be done and sure. had to be documented by you know by by them, and then they give us the green light to start excavating, excavation, build your forms, tie your reinforcing steel. Uh, we place the concrete by a variety of means. You know, sometimes we're lucky enough that uh, you know the concrete truck can just back right up to the foundation site, sure. or maybe we can reach it with a pump. But you know, it's every year we are we're flying concrete. Uh, we use a helicopter to you know you fill up a one yard bucket, and he flies that one. You fill up another bucket while he's flying the first one. He comes trades it out and sure. just keeps trading them back and forth. And and these tower foundations are you know it can be anywhere between on the very small end maybe only eight yards. For a smaller lift, maybe you're in the tower foundation, uh, but I've seen them grow up to anywhere between 15 to say 20 yards of concrete. And what is for for people who don't know how much concrete that is? Like, what is that compared to like a small house or something like that? Oh, do I don't know? know. Oh, I don't know. Is the house <laughs> on a slab or is uh, it in the basement? <laughs> Help me out here. I'm, I'm just trying to get like you know for people who don't have a feel for how much concrete that actually is. Like, give them what what's an example of what what 15 yards might look like. Got any idea? One and a half mixer trucks. How's that? Perfect. I like it. There you go. All right. So that's a fair <laughs> bit of concrete then. Yeah. And if the, heli- the helicopter at these elevations are typically only flying, well, the Blackhawk that we've been using lately, he can do a, uh, a yard or maybe even about a yard and a quarter at a time. So, but nice. uh, other uh, other machines, you know, maybe are only flying a half to a three quarters of a yard, you know, at a time. Yeah. So. Gotcha. It's many trips. Gotcha. <laughs> many, many trips. And then the towers, you're assembling those on flat ground, I assume, right? Like in the parking lot or something like that. And you're you're assembling them like shaped of a T, right? Like we a, don't fly them complete. You don't fly them complete. Okay. Uh, we have, the, but that's an entirely different helicopter. Okay. Um, it's like a double rotor it, giant. Well, uh, yeah, we've we've used that uh, the, uh, Chinook the, the Chinook okay. and and uh, the Vertol is the smaller version of the same machine, kind of. Uh, but we have used those once or twice. Uh, other times we've used uh, the Sikorsky S9, and it's that's a also just known as a Sky Crane. Okay. There's only two companies in the in the country that that operate those, and okay. you know, you ever see national news video of far you know, if, uh, you know wildfire fighting somewhere? Uh-huh. You know, you've probably seen them. Okay. Um, so, uh, but they are very expensive, and it's got to be a really big job for us to really justify you know that cost. Okay. Know, yeah. Okay. So usually, uh, so, it's uh, so tower. typically we're you know we're using a smaller machine, but like I said, that uh, that Blackhawk. You know, he can do 6,000 pounds at 10,000 feet. Mm-hmm. Lower elevations, he's done eight, 9,000 pounds. You know, okay. He's, 
Um, but uh, so yeah, we fly the tower in itself, just the tube okay. section. Is, is if the it's ladder a, already on it too, right? Yes. It, that way you can start putting the other thing up. Okay. Yeah, we got to be able to climb the ladder and receive the. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so everything is uh, everything is assembled and all the preparation work and the way of uh, you know the bolts that we use to to put the next piece together. Okay. We've actually taken some time to make the threads fast and clean. Okay. So okay. that it's virtually a no tools operation. Because when we land, you know, at under the helicopter, and we're paying sixty five hundred bucks an hour, you okay. know, right? You know, uh, you know, then we're basically landing that next section with just two bolts, and those couple of bolts, like I said, have been made fast, so that we can zip, 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 just, you know, and just, then we can cut them free, and while he's going back to the stage yard to get the next piece, well, then we can throw in some more bolts, you know. Okay. Gotcha. Kind of at our leisure, but those two bolts are going to keep it from, you know, yeah, keep from crashing to the ground. And yeah, so, gotcha. um, so yeah, that's uh, so then it's another heli operation where you're just going up a tower with no T basically on top, but that's a whole another assembly that the helicopter then brings in and drops on top of the of the pole of the tower. Of the tower, right? yeah, that's all the same day though. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, so you're Boom! They're landing the tower. You're you're, you're we land the tower bolts. on the we land the tower base on the foundation, and we just again those threads have been made fast. Those yeah. the, those bolts that are embedded in the concrete. Sure. So we spin the nuts down. Yeah. Just just hand tight. Yep. Climb up. If it's a multi stage tower, then we catch the next section, or we just go to the top and we catch the cross arm. Okay, and that cross arm, same thing. They're just dropping it on. You got bolts, and you're just two boom. bolts. Just two bolts right away. Cut them free, you know, set them right. free. And then, depending on the weights and uh, depending on some options that the ski area can decide on uh, that can make the cross arm heavier, uh, basically it's maintenance access, what type of maintenance access they want, then sometimes we can pre-assemble the shiv assemblies onto the tower. Other times we have to fly those separately. And the shiv assembly, that's... that's the wheel. The that's wheels. the wheel, basically. For the wheels the, that the cable goes for over. For the non-professionals like you. Um, all right, and then we're just, we got to skip this. But anyway, then eventually you're able to to put the cable up as lo- along with the comm lines between it, and then the chairs is the last step. Mm-hmm. And then are you putting in the the motor and everything at the at the bull wheels and everything too, or is that like a different crew too? Um, for okay, so there are two stations of the lift. You know, the your your power plant. Okay, the mm-hmm. it, it, what we is what we call the drive. Okay, terminal. Okay. Typically, they're situated at the top because it's more efficient to pull the load than to push it. Okay. Right? Um, but they do exist at the bottom sometimes, depending on, you know. Um, when that uh, ar- arrives to the field, there's a lot of pre-assembly that has been done at the factory. And these are very large, very heavy loads. Uh, the, the the lift I uh, just did in, in copper, the two that we did in, in, in copper... The drive frames, okay, which included the the motor and its bull wheel and all of its braking mechanisms and a few other odds and ends, mm-hmm. they were, for one lift was 90,000 pounds, the other one was 98,000 okay. pounds. Okay. Okay. So these are very heavy loads. Uh, they're typically wide loads, the bull wheel, mm-hmm. okay, uh, so... Yeah, uh, so that's a that, that that's a pretty major deal, you know, when that day comes. And they're driven up, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have driven, a helicopter. Sometimes, no, no, we don't fly those, be- <laughs> those pieces. Um, no, if it's a if it's a situation, say the Kensho lift at Breckenridge, mm-hmm. on, underneath uh, Peak Six. Okay, uh, there's no road to the top of that lift. That's a detachable six pack chair. Okay, that's a bottom drive. Because there's a yeah, road to the bottom, okay? The top station, okay, basically your bull wheel is a free-spinning shiv, mm-hmm. you know, that's you know, situated horizontally instead of vertically like they are on the towers, right? Yep. So uh, all of that, all those pieces can be flown separately and more assembly is done, you know, up there at the, at the actual site to, yeah. to put the pieces together. Uh, and, you know, if it's a situation like that where a terminal needs to be flown, well, the terminal needs to be built completely different 
you know, differently than or than than what we the way we typically do it. Yeah. If you you know consider the idea of modular building for like modular homes, mm-hmm. that's very much the idea of how we do our terminal construction. Yeah. You know, in like I said, a typical situation where semis can actually reach the terminal site. Yeah. Sometimes it is a road to reach the terminal site, but it's not friendly enough for a semi. So we transfer the load to another type of trailer, or we actually have a set of dollies that basically you put one under the front of the piece and one under the back of the piece, and the dolly that's under the back of the piece actually has steering capabilities. Uh, okay. So. Gotcha. You can negotiate tight corners and switchbacks and that kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, those things, they just add more and more headaches and just more and more, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's just. Right. Yeah. Right. It's a major undertaking to say, all right, you know, the piece arrived from the factory today and we got it up to the hill. You know, up, you know, we got it up to the site. Yeah. Tomorrow, the crane grabs a hold of it and actually puts it, you know. Sure. Any crazy lift stories? And I know, I know of at least one in New Zealand that you've told before, so you could do that one or do a different <laughs> one. Uh, yeah, I worked in New Zealand twice, but uh, Mount Hutt, affectionately known as Mount Shut, mm-hmm. that was back in 2005. And, uh, yeah, I got blown away at the base of the mountain, at the base of the ski area. I Not even at the, su- that was at the bottom station. That right? was right outside the base lodge. I mean, I probably, tell the whole story. I, well, okay. So we had seen, you know, we, we, we had seen some of the wind, you know, and I mean, the stories are all around from the people who live there, you know, about, you know, people in their camper vans getting blown off the road, a lift shack getting blown off the mountain, you mm-hmm. know, this and that. And, we had seen, you know, so a, you know, a little bit of it, you know, up to that point. Uh, just about a week before, a guy on the crew, a local dude, he uh, he got injured, actually, in an effort to keep a piece of plywood from blowing away. It was sitting on a forklift. He, jumped, he stood on it uh-huh. while the wind got underneath it, and it folded him up against the fork cage, and he chipped the bottom of his tibia there, yeah. basically hyperflexed his ankle you know, sure. when he, you know, the plywood he was standing on trying, you know, trying to keep it from blowing away, you know, folded it up anyway. I had lost the door to one of our, to one of our little trucks, what they call utes down there. Uh-huh. The utility. And just, <laughs> yeah. just blew it open and when it was open. Yeah, and... just folded it 180 degrees around the front fence. Sure. <laughs> so we, it took three of us to reef it back around and, uh-huh. you know, put a ratchet strap on it to hold it close. Sure. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so we started getting small experiences with it. And, you know, after Russell got his ankle broke there, we said, okay, I think we're starting to get humbled here. And, yeah, it was about a week later that it was really gusty. It wasn't steady winds. It was really gusty. And, you know, Mm -hmm. but we were seeing the signs. So it was kind of late morning and we were like, you know what, let's bag it. Let's get out of here. So we were starting to park all of our equipment and this and that. And, and man, it just... uh, I was I, I was uh, standing back while uh, you know one of my workmates was backing up a, a, a truck and trailer to park it, and I saw my you know my 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 hat and, and glasses they 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 left uh-huh. you know they went flying out in front of me and suddenly I was you know following them I don't think I was ever any more than two three inches off the ground but, but you were literally flying through the I air was distinctly from doing I was distinctly doing the running man and not touching the ground. Wow. I probably went a good 50 feet. I touched, briefly touched the ground, just a little skip twice in that distance. And then all well, my feet caught like a steel beam. That was part of some of the, you know, lift parts that we were working on there. So that, you know, basically tripped me. Uh huh. And I skidded another 10 plus feet on my face. Wow. <laughs> so what, I mean, what's a, what's a wind gust take to blow a, Oh, they reported 120 okay. that, that day. Their okay. their anemometer there at the, yeah. at the base area, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you know, I think everyone out here is seeing either snow or dust devils, right? Right. Well, we would regularly see rock devils, <laughs> just rocks flying through. The yeah, air. like marble to golf ball size. Wow. Just you know, you see it coming. You couldn't feel anything, but you'd see it coming. You say, "Oh shit! I got, we, let's go high." <laughs> <laughs> everyone <laughs> duck for cover. <laughs> yeah. So, um, is it hard leaving Crested Butte every summer and, and, you know, being away from all your friends and, um, you know, a girlfriend if you have one at the time, 
how how hard is that to leave every single summer? It's tough, you know. Um, I mean, I've, I've I've invested a lot of time in, uh, in 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 being here and all kinds of different little deals or little recipes to try and make it work, you know. Right. Um, which I'm, you know, finally there. I, you know, I got, I, I got myself a nice, nice place in CB South, but, uh, yeah, it hurts to be, you know, to know you have this chill place and a place you love and you don't, you don't get to spend all that much, all that much time mm-hmm. at the same time. You know, this is, this has been the best gig I've found that's enabled me to afford, you know, right. either my lifestyle or my place, you know? Sure. So it's, you know, I guess double-edged sword. Kind of, yeah. You know? I've been lucky enough to mostly work at just other places in Colorado. So when I get the weekend, you know, it's you can at least come maybe back. two and a half, three hour drive sure. or something to come back home for the weekend and hang out. And yeah, uh, yeah, and and that's been nice. There's been other times, obviously. Say like Newland, you don't come back for the weekend <laughs> from there, you right. know. Uh, but I've worked other places. I've worked in Canada a few times. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've worked in Washington State and California. Yeah, I've worked um, uh, shorter stints in New York or Vermont. I mean, it's possible maybe this summer. Um, you know, Crest Beats already. Announced that they're going to re- replace the Tia Kali chair. Right. So maybe you'll get lucky and get to stay here, but maybe not. But, um, you know, and we've talked about this a bunch. So so go ahead, and now's your chance to tell everybody your dream lift layout for Crusty Butte. <laughs> so go ahead and tell us where all the lifts going and what are they doing. It's funny. I can't escape this conversation. No, but, you can't. <laughs> well, that's three times at the Avalanche, at least, you know. And not, I'm like, how many times last season I talked with everybody about yep. redesigning the mountain <laughs> okay so what it's what not all it? about my ideas i you know it's you know it's theirs too I mean, sure just... sure well what what's what's well let's hear it though where, where are the list going where are the list going yeah well i i i from what i know of the tia collie lift to mm-hmm. re to rejoin the top of red lady uh, sure i like that, that and that makes a ton of sense yeah like that i'm all for the tia collie bowl um you know expansion as far as building lifts back there okay i would I don't know. Personally, I would probably only start with the exit lift at first. Okay. You know, and just see how okay. things are, just kind of see how things go and maybe, you know, feel out some of the other terrain. You could start, I think some of the other terrain is accessible without, you know, the 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 other lift that was planned. Um, the last time I saw, you know, where the detachable lift was going to go, I that, that personally, I, would, I, I didn't really care for that idea. I don't know if that's the current... And this is all in the Tiakali drainage, as they're calling it, which has a mix of yeah. intermediate terrain and basically and also, staying low. Yeah. yeah. If I were to put a lift in Tiakali drainage mm-hmm. to do laps, sure. Well, I would just put the bottom at the bottom of TO two and bring it up through that that big that big north facing forest on the far skiers right of TO two and land it up at the top of the ridge that splits TO one and two. And then because you could, I I, I think you could we, we you know the, that 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 forest could be maybe you could maybe thin it out or even cut a few runs sure through there gotcha and you know the number one thing that Crested Butte is really missing everyone says it's intermediate terrain but if you go by the numbers the number one thing that we're missing are is uh, single black diamond runs sure and you would know that as an instructor I'm sure some of your some of your lessons you're like well okay that's not a common complaint but sure. that's what i said that's still what i say. <laughs> <laughs> well there is i mean it's it's kind of a weird gap between going up the north face yeah. and yeah. you know skiing skiing paradise bowl or, or something like that so right. and what it i mean so twister chair i assume you want a new twister chair in your dream i would love to see yeah. a new i would love to see a new twister chair i would put the bottom i, I don't know anywhere from say Near Tower 12 of the Red Lady Lift, or down by the uh, fork of Lower Twister and Big Owls. Okay, so just just below the Uli's. Below Uli's, okay. yeah. Let people walk out of Uli's and click, click, and ski down to a lift, instead yep. of have to walk over okay. to where it's kind of, you know, hidden. And bring the top to the, to the top of the Queen. To the top of the Queen. To the top of the Queen. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, that's where I would, yeah. Yeah. And what about some of the existing lifts? I mean, do you think that the Silver Queen should be a six-pack? Do you think the Paradise or East River? Or should all those just be quads? 
as they are. I don't know. Maybe the next few years will really <laughs> will, 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 will help answer that question. We'll have to see, <laughs> see how the epic crowds go. And I thought about there. the queen. I, I, I thought about the queen. Uh, typically, those six pack chairs being so heavy, they actually perform better in the wind. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know the queen is shut at least twice a twice a year. Sure. Because of wind. Sure. Because of high wind. Which isn't bad, honestly. There's a lot of, I think, some of the front range resorts probably have lifts that close a whole lot more than twice a year, honestly. Yeah. I know, it's yeah. windier there, but... Mm. Um, but that's, you know, I mean, especially for that purpose, that's why we need a, a you know, a decent twister chair. Right. Right, because that would be more protected because it's on the other side of that ridge, so to speak. Well, let's start to wrap it up a little bit. Crested Butte is home for you, even though you work everywhere else in the summer. Why do you, why do you still choose to make Crested Butte home? It's a little bit by default, I guess, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, I could say I followed my dreams, but, you know, much later I found out my dreams didn't know where the hell they were going either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> or it could be like, you know, Al's old coffee cup. You know, CB, where even I fit in. <laughs> we are the island of misfit toys, as someone has, has called it before. So, fair enough. That was not the answer that I was expecting or have received before. Okay. <laughs> Anything else I should have asked that I didn't? So, one, one more question. Um, so, you are from Pennsylvania, which is the Poconos. And uh, as we just were finishing up, you mentioned that the Poconos and Tomichi, which is Tomichi Creek and... and street in Gunnison that there's a relationship there so what go ahead and drop your knowledge well I, <laughs> I recently <laughs> learned that uh, the word the word Pocono I don't remember what uh, you know uh, Native American language it, it, it's from exactly but uh, ba- loosely translated means uh, water between rocks and referring to the Delaware water gap which is right on the state line between Pennsylvania and New Jersey Okay. And then uh, the word Tomichi, I also learned, also means water between rocks, referring to the Black Canyon of the Gunnison River. All right. So I figure it was some kind of serendipitous meaning there, you know. With you going with from... Me, with, 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 with me and something about between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> I, I flow. And then the final question is, who else should I interview? What should you interview? I think the the couple I suggested already. I think you've already you've already done them. Yep, you mentioned Johnny Biggers. So go back and listen how about to that uh, one. did you interview uh, Dave McGuire? I have not interviewed. Dave it could be a good one, Matt McGuire. Awesome. Yeah, that's a good one. I need to, anyone else coming to mind or <clears throat> call it Mac? Okay, maybe um I don't know. Hartman is the now you know director of the ski school. Sure, Dave Hartman. Sure. He could be. Yep. Yep, you two, could have, two instructors. There you go. So, you know, um, boy, I don't know. I've seen a, you know a few of the people that you've done already. So, you've had, you've had some good ones. Well, thanks. I try, and <laughs> that's thanks to sometimes uh, suggestions by the people I interview. So, all right. Well, let's let's just call it there. So, thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you on the hill. Thanks for listening to the Crest Beat Is Home podcast. This is your host Frank Consella. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please leave me a rating and or a review and subscribe if you did enjoy the show. And uh, spread the word. If you think you know somebody who might enjoy the show, let them know about it. Really appreciate it. You can find all of my podcasts as well as real estate information at CrestyBeatIsHome.com. And I will be back in a couple weeks with another episode on the podcast.